welcome to another episode of Share Slice with Sean. Remember, you can listen to all the previous episodes over at shareslicepodcast.com. You can also subscribe to the show there as well. This week, I'm happy to have Seattle-based comic book writer Miles Greb talk about comics and what makes them cool. He'll also talk about his new comic, After the Gold Rush. He successfully funded the print version of this over at Kickstarter recently. Now, I don't think I did a great job introducing this during the interview, so here's an extract from Miles' Kickstarter page. After the Gold Rush tells the story of Titanborn Scout as she returns to her ancestral home of Earth. The first issue is a little more Twilight Zone than the rest of the series, but like science, After the Gold Rush starts with a mystery. I'll admit that comics never really have been my thing personally, but this comic is special because it is a science comic. You can be part of this project in the future by supporting Miles over at Kickstarter starting June 1st. Now, without further ado, let's jump right in and talk with Miles. Basically, I, I had a paper route when I was a kid and uh, part of the perks to the paper route is they would give us free comic books, believe it or not. So well, those are probably worth a lot more than they would have paid you if you would have kept them. Had I had kept them. Yeah. <laughs> that's the big problem right there. Essentially, you did a Kickstarter fundraiser and you were able to raise enough money to put out part one of after the gold rush is is the name of the the comic yeah we we did a successful kickstarter and thanks to really popular skeptics and science podcasts like skeptic the skeptic guide to the universe we got a lot of press and we did really well we're actually funded to do the first four but we are only planning on printing issue number one the next couple we're going to release just digitally online because saves a lot of cost but there's been a lot of demand from fans to get number two printed um so we're going to run a kickstarter on june 1st to get enough funds to do that and if people miss that on number one, they can get it from that Kickstarter as well. I actually got the uh, the digital copy, I guess, to save a few trees. But I can see why sure. people would be interested in getting the the actual physical piece of art that they can yeah, have in their, it's their just house. It's a different experience when you can kind of deconnect from all of your electronic devices and sit down and actually read something. I, I prefer reading it that way. Um, also, I can sell them at conventions and stuff, which helps the book keep going. So, I guess it's the story of a young scientist who went off on a mission into space and then she's coming back to the planet earth and something rather catastrophic has occurred um yeah uh so scout has never actually been to earth um, oh, okay. she was part of yep yeah so she um was born and grew up on titan which is one of the moons of saturn um she was there as part of the beagle 2 mission um, named after Darwin's famous Beagle mission to the Galapagos Islands, where we got most of the information we learned about um, evolution by means of natural selection. A lot of that information was gained by that voyage Darwin took. Um, so her ship's named after that. So they were there to be the first manned mission of Titan, um, Scott's two parents, and she was born there as part of the mission to test um um, creating new life, you know, having children on different planets. So Scout grows up there. Um, she only knows her two parents, and the society she's from, obviously she doesn't grow up on Earth, but the culture still permeates from her parents, is very technological, very scientific-based. You know, she doesn't know anything about superstitions or religions. She grows up trying to be a biologist like her mother, and um, eventually something goes wrong. She was placed in cryo sleep in her ship for a long time. And the fail-safes on the ship, after it runs out of resources, eventually send her back to Earth. When she arrives at Earth, her ancestral home, she finds it this vivid wilderness. It's not a post-apocalyptic story. Every she, she doesn't see things the way she'd expect them to be, these skyscrapers, all this technology that we had. Instead, it's, it's trees and valleys. Um, but something else happened to the world. I, I can't say what it is, though. You'll have to keep reading. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, for some reason, I guess I just uh, had assumed. I, maybe I, I had uh, some sort of flashback to the Planet of the Apes or something, and I sure. had, uh, you know... So she has real no real concept of, I guess, what was lost, if you want to put it into quotation marks. Yeah, 
So, I mean, she has basically like the internet with her. It's a, a database that's massive of all kinds of you know, human history and technology that she can recall on her wrist that um, heads up display kind of device she uses. Um, so she knows about what we had and she grew up learning about this stuff, but she's never actually experienced it. So she's kind of socially awkward. She's never met other people, obviously. Um, but she was expecting it to be much different than it is. There was one scene in particular that I really liked. It showed her just arriving on the earth. She sees water, this pool of water. She's there and she's sort of motionless. She has her eyes closed. In the same frame in itself, it shows her in cryogenic sleep, I guess, as well. Yeah, we, we actually added that we actually added that page later. It wasn't in the original script, but as I was looking over all the inks, as Isaac was returning them to me, I thought we needed this kind of still moment of her in the water and this kind of like flashback to how she was. And so um, we designed that page later and added it, but I think it adds a lot to the story, so I'm glad it's in there. Oh, yeah, I, I, it stuck right out to me. And uh, again, I, I guess I was surprised at how economical the storytelling can be using comics. So I had this notion that, you know, pictures probably need to have a fair number of them to express an idea. Whereas in reality, it's it was the opposite. Like that, even that little frame, uh, split frame there told so much. Yeah, um, comics are a really interesting medium. Um, the thing about them is you can get a visual storytelling without having a massive budget, which means you can have less people involved, less producers. So you, you can be a bit more creative than you can with, say, film. Um, so I, I really like comics for that particular reason. So you, you can do things like really stick in emotion with just one image. You don't have to explain it a lot if it's drawn really well. And, you know, I think Isaac and I have made a really good team and he's able to capture the feelings I want in each panels, um, especially in that page, but with his others as well, um, towards the end of the book, but I don't want to spoil what happens there. So. I don't want to spoil it either. Yeah. It, it ends on, on a real cliffhanger. So I'll, I'll let everyone know. I, I definitely am looking forward to getting part two. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, book two and three are going to be way better than number one. Um, Isaac's drawing them this weekend. Um, so we're working on getting that Kickstarter going June 1st and, uh, you know, if you like number one or if you're interested in the story so far, I definitely recommend checking it out because you can get number one in the, that Kickstarter as well. So so Isaac, he does the inks and you do. How does that work exactly? So I'm the writer and the creator. Um, I, I made up the story. I invented the characters. You know, I, I, I write out the script. I send the script. And then what the artist typically does is give you pencils, um, like kind of a rough layout. And I give all my comments on the layout. And, you know, we decide the way things want to look. And then Isaac draws all the inks over top of that, sends it back to me. You know, I make little notes and then we get going and then we get it colored. Um, so comics is, you know, a collaborative kind of team process where it takes a little while to get things going. But, you know, once it does, it's really cool to see how it turns out. So let's get back a little to the science communication scene, because mm -hmm. that's something else. I guess I'm interested in maybe the angle and at, without giving away too much of the plot, I guess maybe that might be some of the problem. So after after the gold rush, um, the, the reason why I started writing it is I was at Emerald City Comic Con with the really big Seattle comic convention two years ago. And while I was walking there, I saw this really awesome trend in comics. And there was all kinds of people who were being included in the medium that weren't traditionally there. You know, comics were created in the 40s by mostly men, uh, mostly white uh, folk and, and Jewish writers at the time. So a lot of that is what was in comics. They were writing who they were and for who they were. And so it wasn't till later on that we started to get more diverse voices in comics we have a large increase of comics that um are from a more female perspective now we have a lot more inclusion of um different queer groups in comics and i thought that was a really good thing but what i didn't see was kind of the hard science skeptic and atheist perspective represented in comics and i've actually been specifically told by marvel that they don't really want to mention atheism in their comics <laughs> even though that they try to be really inclusive you know still as atheists atheist, we just can't be included so i thought well i'll do it myself and so after the gold rush was an attempt to do that but i, I want to make it clear the point of after the gold rush although it's an atheist comic there's no god in our world it's it's set in reality it's very scientific based everyone can enjoy the story i hope because the, the general theme of this book more than those secular points which are very important to me is trying to return to optimistic sci-fi this gene roddenberry carl sagan we can be better in the future we can build things our knowledge helps us kind of idea. And so that's the core of After the Gold Rush, but it has many other themes. I kind of like this because uh, it, all you need to do is dial back to 
I guess, the 50s and and their science fiction in the 60s as well, to see sort of a positive view of science, or, or, or as you say, even Star Trek, you have a positive view of science there. Yeah, Star Trek, I mean, like the main theme of TOS was just exploration. You know, there wasn't even a sweeping narrative to the whole thing. It was how awesome is finding out new stuff. And, and that was always interesting to me. You know, growing up, I, I saw all those... 50s, you know, nuclear age, kind of, we're going to build so much, we're going to go so far, the world's going to be better, you know, there's going to be more um, brotherhood in the world, and, you know, I still think we can do that, and things are getting better, I mean, world hunger is down, you know, um, lifespans are up, things get better, it doesn't mean there's not problems, it doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about problems, but if we, all we do is deal with warnings, with how things are bad. What's the problem? We're never going to focus on our goals. And so what's the point? My son uh, goes to science class sometimes in his school. He's pretty young. And they're like, here, look, here's science. We're going to take we're going to take some vinegar and we're going to add some some baking soda. Look, science. And, and it's like, that's not science. Sure. I don't mean to throw shade here, but there's sites like, you know, I fucking love science that they, they promote more kind of the weird findings or engineering which isn't science science is a methodology science is about making sure that we can test hypotheses that we can see make sure that we remove any biases from ourselves any confusions in the data that we get other people to test our work and replicate our work science is a process of determining what is true about reality to the best of our ability science isn't any of its end results as carl sagan says it's more of a thought process than a um, any one discovery. And I think that that's really important people understand that. And that I'm trying to get that across and after the goal there, specifically because Scout, although she knows a lot about the scientific method and discoveries, she's living in a world where she doesn't have all the, um, all the technology she would need to show the power of science. So she's going to have to demonstrate it to people without that and just having the methodology and the knowledge. So When I was a kid, they had this show on PBS called 3 to 1 Contact. It wasn't like, let's see how many things this episode we can blow up or, you know, or, or they, they didn't have to go through this mantra where they were saying, Science is cool. Science is fun. I love science. Science is great. They just went to different places and they just, they showed you, sci they showed you, I guess, what scientists did. And they also, they went through the theories. At, in one episode, one of the characters found a bone and they went through the, the process of figuring out whether it was a dinosaur bone. It turned out to just be a horse's bone, right? Sure. And it, it, it led you into a story. It's, it's also good to learn to be wrong. Um, it's, it's a very important part about science. It shouldn't be seen as a negative thing or a dead end. Um, confirming your suspicions or disconfirming them is a very key part of the method. So it's good that they showed they were wrong. It really sort of captured some of the wonder, uh, but also some of the story. Like if you like occasionally I watch the old uh, Cosmos with uh, Carl Sagan and I, I'll admit I kind of tear up. Some, at points, it's really it really had a profound effect on me. Not only is Carl an excellent explainer, not only is he does he get excited about science, but if if you take a look at his bookshelf, I mean, I saw it on a website uh, with his his wife Andrean was showed Carl's um, bookshelf, and on his bookshelf he had the classics, he had the Loeb classics, he had literature. Right. Sure. And, and all the great writing. Books. And and he even mentions I, I don't know where exactly it was, but he mentions how in when he went to university, they didn't just feed him core science. They also made him read literature. I mean, I don't I don't want to poop on anyone here and, and and, you know, make people upset that they have to go read books. But I mean, and but, you know, science fiction, a, a great science fiction novel you know, it, it it can fill the same void as someone who, you know, years ago read um, Homer's Odyssey or something like that. In fact, the two Definitely. are almost the same. The two are like science fiction. Yeah, I um, that's a major thing I want to do is try to bring the humanities into science advocacy. Because I feel like it's really important that we don't just see our sci-fi be kind of essentially westerns with lasers. I think we need scientific literature 
that is based on telling human stories, but still actually involves science and, and kind of real technology. So I try to be very scientifically accurate with that for the Gold Rush. I have a section in the back of the book called Peer Review, where if uh, I do anything in the book that you feel is inaccurate or if you'd like to comment on the science of anything, you can write in and we'll publish a, a correction in the back. So. And that I mean, that's that's great. And that teaches people that it's it's fine to be humble and it's fine to because we're all in this together. We're all part of this collaborative effort to learn w the truth, like how things work in the universe. Yeah, definitely. And, and things are complicated. Reality is under uh, no pressure to be easy to understand. And no one is likely to understand it by themselves. It, it takes our peers. And takes people from all different kinds of backgrounds and thought processes. That doesn't mean everybody's input's going to be useful, but everybody's input is welcome because it might be. Exactly, and and, and again, when I was a kid, I remember reading. Um, I mean, my these are actually my dad's books. Um, <laughs> my dad had these books uh, in his bookshelf from the fifties. And uh, I think one was called something like "Rocket Ship to the Moon" or something. And in mm -hmm. a certain extent. I mean, a lot of this wasn't scientifically correct, but part of it, I think, is because they didn't really have a good idea of how things really worked sure, in these know, places. People, but people it, were just hoping, hoping yeah. that space would be like this or that, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. It was it was so inspirational that it made me wonder. I mean, I then I went out and I studied the planets. I mean, I did all this, and it, it kind of made me wonder, like, uh, you know, the 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 all of that enthusiasm for the space program back in the the early 60s right up to the late 60s and into maybe i guess the mid 70s or something i mean all that popular enthusiasm about the space program it makes me wonder how much of that might have been fueled by like science positive fiction and film yeah i i mean it definitely inspired me so i mean that's anecdotal but kirby quit whining and uh sorry as my dog oh it's a problem <laughs> um you know when the, the media you see is, impacts you and inspires your vision especially when you're younger doesn't mean it's going to for everybody but i think it's really important that we have these kinds of things out there for the people that want to be the builders the makers and the movers of the future if all they see is these zombie post-apocalyptic negative you know everything's going to hell stories then I, I don't know how much inspiration you're going to get from a whole generation. So I'm just one guy. I'm just writing comics. You know, I'm not making a big budget movie or anything, but I'm trying to do my best to to get that get that feeling back. Do you have any other uh, projects that you're working on as well, or or any kind of other things you want to talk about? Oh, so many. Um, <laughs> I have Clovis, which is another. Is this is actual graphic novel or released completely in like a large book form? It's it's, you know, a comic, but graphic novel form. It is a, a prehistorical fiction. It is a story about a young mother who is alone in this um, Pleistocene, the megafauna era of North America, when we had like seven foot tall giant sloths and all the mammals that were here were much larger and, and different. Um, the Clovis people were one of the earliest groups of uh, people who lived in North America. They're the possible ancestors of what we now call Native Americans or South Americans. The science there is kind of complicated, so I won't get into that specifically, but they are the ancestors of the people here in North America, one of the earliest settlers. So I'll be, that will be coming out in August. We'll be kickstarting that. Um, that is a work between me and um, a few other people, but um, chiefly... The artist is named Zach, and he's done a wonderful job on the book. Um, you can actually follow him on Twitter if you want. I post him around. It's just uh, Zach um, Osar is his Twitter if you want to check him out. But his work's been fantastic. Um, going on, I'm also working on a fantasy story, different from science. There'll be not much science in this one. It will be called Espers. And it's um, kind of a cross between like the Final Fantasy and the Civil Rillion, which is this uh, origin story of the Middle Earth, Lord of the Rings universe. Um, it's going to be a story about the introduction of gods into a new universe where the kind of gods wake up and don't know where they are. And their thoughts articulate how the universe is going to be formed as they're being birthed. Um, so, yeah, a bunch of different comics in the works right now. I find that fascinating. I, I mean, it's great that you've got uh, fantasy going on uh, in the in the same strain you know, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I, I grew up loving Lord of the Rings as much as I loved um, scientific futurism um, is very important to me. And so I, 
I, I don't think there's anything wrong with making up fantastical things. I think that's wonderful. We just need to make sure we know that they're fantastical. It, it kind of reminds me a while back. Uh, I can't remember what. I think it was uh, Angelina Jolie was uh, getting upset at uh, Richard Dawkins um, because uh, he was going he was going to kill all the fairy tales or something like that. People enjoy getting upset. I, at I love fairy tales. Everybody loves everybody loves a good story. They just need to know how to separate, um, you know, reality from from fiction, from fantasy. Yeah. I think it's absurd this idea that science, atheism, and skepticism dispel what's magical and what's wondrous and what's confusing and weird in the universe. That's absolutely ridiculous. The Voyager probe is one of the best. Um, ventures in the history of mankind. We sent out a probe for a low amount of money all these decades ago, and it journeys through the cosmos taking pictures of things we've never seen before. We have The Horizon probe does the same. We have pictures of Pluto, this far out rock. It looks nothing as we suspected. We grew up picturing this small bluish purple ball that we painted in third grade. We had little to know about it. We thought it was this cold, icy world, boring. But look at it. It's, it's interesting. We have these high-res images of it, this place that we're never going to go to in our lifetimes. You can, you can sit there and wonder about it, make up stories about it. They can be fantastical. I mean, think how interesting things are when you get smaller, when you think about atoms and quarks and quantum particles. There's so much in this universe that's weird that our minds didn't evolve to understand that we can only understand with science and with the cooperation of getting many people together to test them. I mean, think about the Higgs particle. Somebody used math, a construct that all different cultures, all different societies around the world, from the Greeks to, to the Arabs to the Chinese, have worked together to make this mathematical construct that we have, and it works. We test it together. We use this math to determine that the reason why that there's mass in the universe is there must be this Higgs field. And if we can find this particle, we can determine that the field exists. We, again, as nations, many different nations of the world, unfortunately, the nation I was born into, America, decided not to house it, but it still was built. The large um, hydron collider was built, and we tested this mathematical concept. All these years of people working together, we tested it, and we found the particle. We were right. Uh, that's that's fantasy. That's wonderful. There's no reason to think that, you know, selling somebody that a certain myth isn't true takes any wonder out of the world when we have things like that. You're going to start up a fundraiser, Kickstarter, and this is going to be for part two of After the Gold Rush. Yeah, definitely. Um, you get to um, see what happens to Scout after her return to Earth. Um, you know, we, she's returned. Science isn't there, and we'll have to find out what happens next. Um, it will be on June 1st. Um, the goal is pretty limited. You know, we're just looking for just under 4k. You can, um, you know, it's, it's not donations. Now you, you give us money and we give you books, we give you posters, we give you great stuff. You know, it, it's, um, Kickstarter is a, is a mutual process. You can get a copy of a uh, number one digitally for just six bucks. You can get uh, two printed copies shipped to your house for just $20. We have amazing posters by a lot of wonderful artists that show scout and you know, awesome science settings. And um, if you're into science, if you're into skepticism, atheist comic books, or you think you'd want to be, you should definitely check it out. It goes live June 1st. Definitely check that out. And also, as you said, you have the other project uh, called Clovis, and that's already been funded, right? Oh, no, it, uh, we're kickstarting Clovis in August. August. Um, I have, yep, in August. And uh, Esper's will be sometime next year. I also have a couple other comics I'm working on, but uh, we'll keep it to those three right now. So what website can people go to to take a look at all these different projects and uh, sure. invest in one of them or all of them? Yeah, definitely. After the Gold Rush dot space is my main website. You can check out After the Gold Rush, Clovis, Espers, my comic, The Artist, which I haven't talked about. You can check us on my podcast there. There's a free After the Gold Rush webcomic that follows Scout when she was younger back on Titan. Uh, you can check out my Patreon to help support me so I can keep um, doing little projects on the side for science and comics. My blog's there, or I try to have a good mixture of comics and science. I have a, um, a post there about why we shouldn't label GMOs, and I also have an indie comic recommendation blog up there. So I try to get those done when I have time. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at just, um, what is my Twitter? It's at Gold Rush Comic. You can follow me there. Or if you just Google Miles Greb, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram or wherever you venture on the internet. And that's Greb with just one B. 
G-R-E-B. just want to be yeah, Miles Grepp. Perfect. Miles, thanks so much for being on the show. I think I learned a lot about comics and uh, also about uh, science as well, science advocacy. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Sorry about my rambling and my whiny dog, but my roommate has taken the dog out, so never worry, listeners. Well, that's about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, you can listen to previous episodes over at ShareSlicePodcast.com. You can comment on them, and you can also subscribe to the show there as well using the links. I recently made a new link, ShareSlicePodcast.com slash iTunes. This will bring you directly to the show's iTunes profile, where you can leave a rating or a review. Now, even if you don't listen to this show using iTunes, it would really, really, really help if you leave a quick rating or review there. Thanks so much for everyone who has done this already. I'd also like to welcome any new listeners from the podcast radio network. That's 102.6 over at Crikey Radio. Please tell your friends about the show. If you think you're interesting enough to be on the show or think you know someone who is, please don't hesitate to tweet me over at at Slices Podcast. Remember, all music for this episode is by Chromatics. K-R-O-M-A-T-I-K-S. And it's used with permission. Thanks so much for listening, everyone, and I hope you'll be back next week. presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Cadet Happy is piloting a space observatory while a scientist studies a strange phenomenon. It's an invisible force that completely destroys all matter. Right now, Buzz Corey is in Terra V, warning Happy to veer away from the force, but too late. Out of control, the space observatory whirls toward the invisible menace. Happy! Happy, can you hear me? Pull away from it. I'm trying to, sir, but the rockets don't seem to have any effect. Use full power on your starboard rocket. I am, sir, but we're caught in some sort of a whirlpool. Happy, hit full repeller ray. If you're caught in there, you're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Hole in Empty Space. Extra, extra, read all about it. Buzz Corey offers an official Space Patrol spaceophone set to every boy and girl on Earth. Extra, extra. You hear that, gang? That's right. Buzz Corey will send you a real, honest-to-goodness Space Patrol spaceophone set. Sounds just like a walkie-talkie. Looks just like the spaceophone Buzz Corey himself uses. Imagine, you can talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. Now, let me show you with this spaceophone right here. Uh, calling Bob Rate. Can you hear me, Bob? I'll say loud and clear. Just like talking on the walkie-talkie in the telephone, right? Right. I call it the magic phone you can carry anywhere. Yes, sir. See how the spaceophone sounds, boys and girls? Just like a telephone. Just like a walkie-talkie. And lots of fun. Yes, sir. So send for your spaceophone set today. You get two blue and yellow plastic spaceophones. You get 50 feet of communication cord. You get a spaceophone briefing sheet. Now here's all you do to get the entire set. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. (laughs) 